is questioned, right, as part of admissible evidence as to what could Trayvon have done to cause his own murder. Um, we're watching as his friend um, is demonized and ridiculed on the stand as she describes uh, the last moments that she uh, had to talk to Trayvon. Her literacy and her intelligence be questioned and ridiculed. Um, and then we get to this point, right, where I think a lot of people uh, in America are thinking, hey, this man killed a child, right? Mm -hmm. And um, there's this narrative that the defense is trying to put forward that's saying, well, actually, Trayvon fought George Zimmerman. <clears throat> and I don't know if you all remember this, but there was a moment where uh, the, the trial kind of suggests that uh, THC was found in uh, Trayvon's system and uh, suggests that somehow uh, smoking weed could have made a 17-year-old child a violent hulk, right? Um, and I'm fascinated by this because I have a brother who's 26. He's over six feet tall. And you know, to me, he's the sweetest, most gentle person I've ever met. But to anyone else, right, because of his height, because he's black, because of his appearance, um, he may seem like a monster, right? Um, so I'm watching this and talking with friends and, you know, I've, I've been doing uh, organizing for a long time and I'm not somebody who believes that the criminal system delivers justice, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that that's what our systems are set up to do. But even still, I wanted to know that this man was gonna be held accountable for the killing of a black child. And you know, there was lots of speculation about what was going to happen. Uh, I certainly didn't think that he was going to walk away scot-free. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and what he did, <clears throat> I think a bunch of things happened, me personally, and I think this experience resonated with a lot of other people as well. <clears throat> so one piece of me, um, I just felt like I got punched in the stomach. I didn't know what to say, what to do. Um, what to think, like it almost wasn't registered, right? Um, and then there's this other piece where it's like, I'm on Facebook trying to get some ground under my feet, right? What are people saying about, you know, the outcome of this trial? And really there's kind of a, two major threads of thought that I'm seeing in my own kind of social media feed. And one thread is, um, you know, it's like social justice cynic, right? Mm -hmm. um, of which I am guilty of being at times. Where, you know, it's this idea that uh, we know better than to depend on the criminal system to deliver justice. Mm -hmm. Why is everybody up in us, right? Um, and that is real, but it didn't feel right to me in that moment because all I could think about was Trayvon's family, right? So George Zimmerman got to go home that night to his family but Sabrina and Tracy went home to an empty seat at the table. They lost their child and they never would get their child back. Um, and so to say in response to them, well, you know the criminal system doesn't work for our people is not actually stupid, right? And it's not motivating, it doesn't help us build a vision of what we need to do. And then on the other hand, there was this whole thread around, you know, this was a terrible tragedy, this never should have happened, so that's why we need our kids to pull their pants up. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need our kids to vote. And that's why we need our kids to get a good education. And that's why our kids should wear hoodies and walk at night. And that's why, and that's why, and that's why, right? But all of this uh, rationale was kind of centered around the notion that somehow black people are like, deficient, right? Mm -hmm. Somehow we are, um, you know, to blame for conditions that we didn't actually create, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that we have brilliantly survived um, and resisted since we were brought here. But quite honestly, um, this this idea of uh, black deficiency, I think is what makes me the angriest. Um, and in that moment in particular, um, I just had reacted to it. And so I wrote a post on Facebook um, that a lot of different people resonated with. And the post ended with, um, black people, I love you, I love us, 
we matter, our lives matter, black lives matter. And Patrice, um, <laughs> my sister in lots and lots of things, uh, put a hashtag in front of it and we posted it. And she and I started talking um, in those hours after the verdict uh, was delivered. And we started talking, I we were upset and processing, talking about what we needed to do in a country that literally um, issued a verdict that said that black people are not safe in this country and mm -hmm. that you can kill us um, with no consequence and for no reason. Mm -hmm. um, so we all kind of come from, by we all, I mean, uh, Patrice and myself, uh, you know, we're part of larger networks of organizers and activists. Um, as you all remember, after uh, the verdict, there were lots of protests and demonstrations. Um, that hope uh, and that break Black Lives Matter started to go viral right away, um, unbeknownst to, to us, right? And so we're seeing in protests and demonstrations that are happening in the days after uh, Zimmerman is acquitted that people are holding protest signs that say Black Lives Matter. Mm. Um, and lots of stuff is happening uh, uh, in the weeks kind of subsequent uh, the the verdict being announced. But one thing I will say is how we knew that um, some shift had happened is that we saw Black Lives Matter in an episode of Law and Order. Mm. And the way it used it was really bizarre. <laughs> it was very bizarre. It was a, an episode that was a mashup of um, Paula Deen's racist behavior. Uh, and what had happened to Trayvon Martin, which was just very complicated. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least, right? It's really disturbing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but generally what happens is that there's a trial scene, as there always is in Law and & Order, and outside the trial there's a protest happening that is not nearly as lively or exciting as the protest that we are a part of. Um, it has people carrying signs to say Black Lives Matter. So that's how we know that it kind of seeps into um, mainstream consciousness. But it's really um, a year later uh, when Mike Brown was killed uh, in Ferguson, Missouri, and uh, Darnell, who you all met, and Patrice, um, organized a freedom ride to Ferguson. And um, I'm sure he talked a whole bunch about that, so I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on it, but what I do want to say about what's important about the Black Lives Matter Freedom Ride is that uh, more than 500 black people are activated from around North America um, and self-organized to be able to get to Ferguson, um, not for disaster tourism, right, yeah. but literally because black people all over the country and all over this kind of hemisphere, right, have this real deep sense that we're not safe and that the only people that can protect us are us. Mm. Um, and then the other piece of that that I feel is really important is um, what we've been hearing from folks on the ground is that um, they weren't able to get the stories out, right? That, that corporate media was coming, talking about rioting and looting, definitely not talking about police terror, not talking about the fact that there's military grade weapons and tanks on the streets in this tiny suburb that barely anybody has ever heard of, um, unless you live there or you live in St. Louis. Um, and so uh, who else goes on this ride, right, of black media makers and culture makers, right, folks who are bloggers and journalists from black outlets. Um, and that creates a really important opportunity for folks in Ferguson to be able to lift up um, not only their own narrative on their own terms about how things got to get to this place, um, but also to really tell the story of what was happening with the resistance. Um, and then the other thing that's really important about that Freedom Ride is that people decide to keep organizing in the groups that they organize with to be able to get to Ferguson in the first place. And so that is really um, part of the birth of the Black Lives Matter network. Um, and so it mainly goes from um, a series of kind of online platforms where people can tell their stories um, and their experiences with anti-black racism and state-sanctioned violence uh, and develops into a burgeoning organizing network that now has more than 30 chapters around the world.
So stop there. It's a big mouthful. <laughs> no, that was so important. I just wanted to, um, and I'm going to immediately have students jump in because I want to uh, be mindful of everyone's time, and I know folks have a lot of questions, so I'm not going to ask as many questions as I want to ask you, Alicia, but I'll save it for another day, hopefully. Um, I did want to um, ask you about your background. Uh, you talked about your organizing background, and so one of the things that I think often gets left out of the story um, <clears throat> in terms of how Black Lives Matter as a movement is narrated in corporate media, uh, much in the same way that we kind of narrate Rosa Parks, for instance, mm -hmm. um, as this kind of figure who emerged seemingly out of the air, um, mm -hmm. when in fact we know that that wasn't the case, that uh, Rosa Parks had a deep and long commitment to social justice work. Your own work and background, I know that you're the special projects director of the National uh, Domestic Alliance Network. Um, um, how has that informed your approach to the movement um, and your approach to organizing? I'm just wondering. Mm, yeah. Um, I'm glad you asked that because often I agree with you that uh, the power of organizing and the um, power of organizations often gets left out of the story. And there's a lot of um, disagreement about this, right? So I'm, I'm saying this in that context. Um, so for Patrice and Opal and myself, we are all um, people who come out of um, organizing traditions that have been informed by um, social movements from uh, civil rights to black power, right? Um, so for myself, I started off uh, in the reproductive justice movement uh, when I was 12, right? Mm. And did that work for a very long time through that work. Uh, got exposed to um, work around criminal justice and prison reform, and then ultimately landed uh, at the intersections of racial, economic, and gender justice, um, and have spent the last uh, 15 years uh, organizing in the Bay Area in black communities, uh, mostly low-income, working-class black communities, uh, around a host of issues uh, but mostly centered around the criminalization of black people and the criminalization of black people in physical space. Uh, so that's what we call gentrification, right? <laughs> um, and um, have really been impacted and influenced by that experience, right? So, um, and it's all full circle now, right? So some of you might have heard about a young man who was murdered uh, less than a week ago in a place called Bayview Hunters Point in San Francisco, California, named Mario Woods. He was shot uh, over 16 times, right? Uh, with his back up against the wall uh, by over six San Francisco Police Department um, officers. Um, and people are, you know, organizing and, and resisting around that as we speak. Um, but Baby Hunter's Point is really one of the places that I cut my teeth as an organizer. Mm. I mean, I organized there for 10 years, public housing residents, um, and folks who were fighting back against environmental racism, gentrification, and police abuse and police brutality. Um, I know Patrice through my mm. organizing work in San Francisco uh, because the organizations that we came from were in a deep relationship with each other. Uh, Patrice was born and raised in Los Angeles uh, and uh, spent quite a, a few years at a place called the Labor Community Strategy Center uh, in Los Angeles, uh, and our organizations were deeply connected. Um, Opal, I know uh, through her work at the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, but to be honest, I know uh, the person who initiated that project, and when that project was initiated back Ooh, I mean, they first started talking about it in 2005 um, because it was Gerald and Nunu who are like old school black internationalists, right? Um, who I knew as I was first entering into these organizations. <coughs> so there's a long history between us, right? Um, and it's not just about the Bay Area. I definitely there is a fabric. Uh, that forms a, like a movement culture, right, mm -hmm. here in the U.S. Um, and while there are many silos, there's also many threads of connection. Uh, another kind of thread there, though, is that uh, the organization I worked in in San Francisco is called People Organized to Win Employment Rights. 
Mm. And we were one of the founding members of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, which is where I work now, right? So um, even the folks in that organization, and Ijen, who's our executive director, I've known Ijen for, shit, um, ten, over 10 years, right? Um, and knew her through her work at Domestic Workers United in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, and was incredibly inspired by her brilliance. And I was like, who is this Asian woman who's organizing Caribbean nannies? You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. right? so, um, there's lots of interconnections and relationship. I will say, just for the sake of being controversial, and I hope you all will talk about this long after I'm on the Skype call. Um, I think there's disagreement about the utility of organizations. Um, I think there's a lot of ways in which people talk about protest as being the central kind of element to any movement, um, and I disagree, right? I mm. think that protest is incredibly important um, as an expression of resistance, especially when it's sustained, right? Um, but protest in and of itself is not liberatory. It's not mm. transformative. Mm. Um, protest has to always be aligned with um, the creation of alternatives that can take the place of brutal and oppressive systems. Um, and it also always has to be aligned with a consciousness raising strategy that is really aiming to win hearts and minds at the same time that it's aiming to disrupt business as usual and the status quo. Mm -hmm. um, and the reality is, right, you can't sustain protest forever. That what has to connect the ebb and flow of protest is deep organizing. And mm -hmm. it's the hard and funky work that everybody, um, lots of people valorize, but nobody wants to do, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is um, bringing people together um, to realize their own power, develop their own vision, and move collectively towards that vision. That is hard work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when we look at narratives from the civil rights movement and even black power, right? Um, lots of what people talk about, right, are the flashpoints, um, but nobody talks about what it takes to get there, right? Yeah. And there's lots and lots of work that people do. My work was knocking on doors at Bayview Hunters Point every single day. And I knocked almost every door in that community several times. Um, and what we're seeing now in terms of the resistance, I think, is tied to the work that people have done in that community mm. for decades, but certainly for the last 10 years, around galvanizing people around what was happening to black folks in San Francisco. Um, and I would say that's similar to what's happening now, right? If there hadn't been um, units of organization, and I don't just mean nonprofits, uh, but there's many different types of political organizations, um, if those hadn't existed, right, the character of what we're seeing right now would be very different if we'd be seeing it at all. Wow. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. I'm going to, um, uh, I'm, okay, so here's what I want you all to do. I'm trying to prep. Okay, so. <laughs> I want you to introduce yourself to Alicia, tell her your name, what you're, what you're studying here at Gallatin, um, and then ask your question, okay? And we want to actually ask a question um, as opposed to uh, attempting to offer a comment in this particular moment, okay? So who's got a question? Yes, Sophie. Hi, Sophie. I'm Sophie. Um, I'm studying the intersections of environmental and social justice here at Gallatin. Um, and I have two, two questions. Is that okay? Um, my, first, <laughs> my first question is, what have you learned since being thrust into the spotlight as a movement um, in, in terms of uh, just like challenges, benefits, uh, you know, just what have you learned um, as opposed to sort of those moments um, before when, when you were doing the deep organizing, like what is different when all of the national attention is, is on you? Um, and then my second is, um, what can, what is the best thing, in your opinion, that white allies and white allied groups can do in this moment? That's a lot. You see, they go right there with a the whole, they, they drop That's off a good. lot. Yeah. <laughs> Sophie, I'm glad you asked both of those questions. Um, I think uh, <laughs> what I've learned from being thrust into the corporate media, right? Um, is a few things. One, patriarchy is a real thing. It's real, it's pervasive, and it's ugly, 
right? So um, there's that. Um, I've also learned that we have a lot of work to do in terms of um, understanding the importance and role of um, giving voice to what's happening in our communities um, and really fighting back against celebrity culture, um, which I think is really hard for folks, right? Um, and the other thing that I've learned is, amongst many things, is that it's really, really important for us to have mechanisms to be able to tell our own stories on our own terms. Um, and that one way that we can disrupt corporate media narratives um, is by developing our own ways of communication, but it is also very much about um, staging direct actions on in within corporate media. Mm. <laughs> the thing that we yeah. that is, um, you know, there's a way in which, uh, even as an organizer, right, I got trained to um, speak in the media in a very particular way. Mm. Um, and one thing I'm just finding is um, it is really important to be able to communicate to many different audiences, but it's also really important um, not to mince words, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then in terms of your question about uh, what is the most important thing for white people or white allies to be doing, um, I think that the most important thing for white folks to be doing right now is organizing other white people to mm -hmm. dismantle racism. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is, I mean, black people can talk about racism until we're blue in the face, um, but we don't control or design it, right? Mm. And um, there's something about this narrative about what can allies do that always seems to miss the piece around disrupting power, right? Um, and always seems to kind of leave open the question of like, well, who's organizing other white people? Right? Mm -hmm. It's not enough just to bring white people in relationship to people of color and black people specifically, um, but white people have to decide that they are gonna defect from the system of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And that takes organizing. Mm -hmm. And white people uh, are the best position to organize other white people. Mm -hmm. It's just the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's my opinion. That's it. That's <laughs> it right there. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. Vince. Vance. Vince. Yes. <laughs> Vince Vance. Yes. Get, 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 stand up. Oh. Ask your question. Am Introduce yourself. Hello. Yeah. I'm Vince. Um, I study human justice, international affairs, and identities in women's music. Um, <laughs> I, I have it's kind of a large question. Um, okay. It's kind of, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on like the relationship between like changing hearts and minds with interpersonal relationships and like the importance of like learning about microaggressions and like um, pronouns and stuff like that versus like structural structural systemic approaches um, through like organizing and like how you see um, the benefits of like a grassroots movement where like one of the dangers of that is like dissenting voices shaping how the nation sees Black Lives Matter and like how like there's there can be um, kind of uh, friction in places because of like I guess um, the less centralized uh, nature of it versus like having kind of like more of a centralized approach to it. Mm, that's a big question. That's a big one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's lots in there. Um, I'm going to answer your question briefly because it's it's too big to take on in the time that we have. Um, you know, I just I have a lot of compassion, right? So um, the question that you asked about the relationship between changing hearts and minds, um, paying attention to interpersonal kind of microaggressions as as it or as opposed to um, broader systems and structures, right? Um, I actually look at it a little bit differently. I don't see it as an either or. I see them as um, interrelated and in a dialectical relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And what I'm seeing in this moment is two things. One, a lot of people are in a process of development. And for most people, their entry point to understanding um, how to articulate how racism impacts them is on the interpersonal microaggression level, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, you know, as we continue to be in the work together, right, we're able to, um, uh, through, you know, political education and all kinds of other things, 
we're able to expand our understanding of the systems that we live under. But those things are not separate, right? Um, and even myself, as somebody who has been in this work for a minute, um, I learn every day, right? I'm learning every day about how the interpersonal relates with the larger kind of structural and systemic, and how the systemic and structural impacts the interpersonal. Um, it's just a process of development. So um, just entering into that conversation with a lot of compassion, I think, is really important. Um, and in terms of my thoughts about it, I definitely have my moments where I get irritated and I'm like, we're not focusing on the right thing. Uh, but I have to remember that we all start somewhere, right? And I have been there many times and I will be there many more times over the course of my life. So um, that's where I stand on that. Um, and then similarly with this question of like, uh, you know, um, the grassroots organization versus kind of decentralization, I actually think it's a false dichotomy. Um, I think that what happens is that people often interchange uh, 501c3s mm -hmm. uh, with organization. Mm -hmm. And I think if we were to look at our history, right, um, and if we're even to look at the landscape right now, um, there's many different ways in which people are galvanized to take action. Nonprofits are one of those ways, um, but political organizations um, of different forms are, I think, the smallest unit of social change, right? Mm -hmm. And I think those things are necessary. Um, and I think that those things can exist inside of a decentralized movement. Um, but it really requires that you have a, a more nuanced understanding of how social movements function um, and how so successful social movements um, have been able to make impactful changes. Um, so I encourage that level of dialogue and learning and study, right? And I feel like I'm still learning a whole lot about that as well. Um, yeah, that's what I'll say on that. Okay, I know we are already over. We Alicia, the time is sacred, and we don't want to. We, she was wonderful enough to agree to thirty minutes, so we don't really. I'm going to get in one last question. Can we do that, Alicia? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's all good. Go ahead, Akira. Hi, Alicia. Hi. Okay, so my name is Akira, and my concentration understanding how spatial geography and visionary futures and shapes the after that work imaginary so not full clue. <laughs> so just so just a quick little so at Gallatin they don't have traditional majors like English history everyone has a concentration so that's why you get these majors that sound like paper topics. That's what we do here at, at NYU Gallatin. I school but I chickened out. Oh. Oh. Wow. <laughs> NYU's lost question, big time. Yeah. My question is really short, and I think it, it focuses on like how does your radical self care look like? Like what does mm. it look like? And knowing that Black folks was never meant to survive, how do you mother yourself in spaces where you feel like a sister outsider? Mm. Um, such a powerful question, and one that I'm still in a lot of deep learning about. Um, I think that when we talk about self-care, we also, like, we individualize it in this way that I feel um, really challenged by, right? Um, and I know for me, part of my tendencies and patterns, especially in movements um, and in movement work, uh, is to try to take on a whole bunch of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that is, uh, you know, true about organizers and activists generally, but it's also very true about about black women, right? Um, and so my self-care looks like asking for help, right? And letting other people have my back. Um, and that's my, that's the process of, of care that I'm in right now. Um, but I think it's different for different people. Uh, part of what's been really helpful for me though has been being really uh, mindful of and actually deeply investing in getting to know myself, uh, my patterns and my habits, and then um, being committed to developing patterns and habits and practices um, that serve me, that serve my commitment, that serve what I care about, and that overall will serve the movement. Um, and I think that we need to be doing that on a collective level, to be quite honest. Um, because for each of us, depending on where we come from, what we care about, what we've experienced, um, we have different needs, right? But we all deserve to be a part of a movement um, that cares about us and that we care for collectively. Um, and so what that means is how do we show up for each other, not just in protests and demonstrations, but how do we show up for each other to become our best selves? Um, so that's the process that I'm in right now. 
Oh my gosh. Alicia, thank you so much for sharing this time with us. We are so appreciative. Thank you. Um, I'm going to, so how can they contact you? Can they send you an email? Or oh, there's a Facebook page like the BLM uh, Facebook page maybe? What's the you best way? You can totally email me. It's all good. Um, my email is Alicia, A-L-I-C-I-A, at domesticworkers.org. You can also hit us up on the Facebook page, but to be honest, there's like a lot of trolls that kind of dominate our message space. Mm -hmm. So if you want to send us an email, you can send it to blacklivesmatter at gmail.com. Um, and we'll be getting back to you. It's a little <laughs> slower on that one because we get a big volume of stuff. Um, so if you want to hit us up directly, you can hit me through my personal email, um, or you can hit me up on Facebook too. Again, thank you so much. I'm going to do one last corny thing. We're going to get an email, uh, a picture with Alicia, a virtual picture. I told you I was going to do this. So we're going to, I'm going to try to do this selfie. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we can totally see. Can you can see, see her? Yeah. Totally <laughs> see her. Uh, all, okay. Safe? So, I feel like... Oh, 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 wait, hold on, hold on. I don't want to be... Frank, we should go to the... I what? Think it's happening. We should go to the street. Oh. We should just crowd. We should do what? Crowd. <laughs> okay, no, that's good. We, we, time, we should go. We're good. We're good. Sorry, Alicia. I'm a mess here. I'm a mess. Okay. We're ready. It's going to be on a three second thing, all right? So I'm going to hit it. Okay. It is our duty to fight for our freedom. Okay. One, two, three. That's going to take three seconds from now. I hope that came. I hope that turned out. Wait, there it goes. Wait, one more time. One, two, Three, it's coming. One, two, three. Okay. Alicia, thank you so much. I will be in touch. Thank you so, so much. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Bye. Thank you. Lisa did a wonderful job of really taking a lot of time to answer each question. So I didn't um, I didn't anticipate that we wouldn't have time to ask all of them. I'm sorry.